Uh, while our uh, access panel is coming up, uh, I'd just like to make uh, two comments. First of all, that's a typical economist answer. You ask him a straightforward question, what's the number? And he tells you it's hard to calculate. Uh, but second of all, I want to thank someone who's not here today. Uh, Professor Valerie Karplis in the Sloan School helped to uh, organize this panel uh, and it, it advised us on, uh, on other panels. Uh, uh, sh uh, we expected her originally to be here today, but she had a choice between being on this panel or going on her honeymoon. And she decided to go on her honeymoon. So we want to thank her, but she's not here. And I'm going to turn this, uh, this panel over to uh, Rob Stoner, uh, who is the Associate Director of the MIT Energy Initiative for Science and Technology uh, and Director of the Tata Center for Energy and Design at MIT. Uh, Kate Steele uh, is the founder of, and, and uh, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Nithio. Uh, and Ignacio Perez Arriaga is a visiting professor here at MIT in the Sloan School and a professor at Camillas University uh, in Madrid. So Rob, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm actually the Deputy Director of MIT. I don't know if that's better than Associate Director of MIT. <laughs> if you want to know more about me, check out my website, www.robstoner.com. Uh, Rob, Rob there's a question. Uh, <laughs> so we've been talking about a lot of fancy stuff, making hydrogen from excess solar superchargers <laughs> on the side of the highway. I'd like to interject the uh, uncomfortable truth here, or inconvenient truth, that we're still adding customers to the electricity system uh, at a pretty high rate. Uh, 10 years ago, there were about a billion and a half people who didn't have access to electricity in any form or at any, in any quantity. Uh, now there may be 800 million people. That's still a lot of people. That's equivalent to the entire population of Europe plus the entire population of North America plus most of the population of South America combined. Um, and we're, we're continuing to make progress in adding uh, people to that, that world of electricity. Um, and a couple of notable examples are India and Kenya, and we'll get to talk about those soon. Big Southeast Asian country that you've all heard of, and a big uh, successful East African country. But Kenya, uh, as a successful African country, and one that will very likely achieve universal access to electricity by 2030, is a bit of an exception. Um, the fact is that, that Africa lags rather dramatically, as you can see from this chart, the other countries of the world in reaching universal electrification. Um, and it's projected that, that by mid-century, we will still have roughly 500 million Africans who have no access at all. Now, that's not because nothing's happening in Africa. It's because the population is expanding very rapidly. Uh, it's currently about a billion people, uh, and by 2040, we'll add another 800 million. So you've got to pedal this machine pretty fast to uh, get it all the way uh, spun up. Certainly what you'd like to do when you're adding connections is add low carbon connections. Uh, and, and the countries of the developing world have been making progress overall in greening their grid-based electrification systems. And most people are connected via the grid, but not all. And, and it's very likely, according to the IEA, that absent startling new policy and transfers of wealth, uh, these systems will be substantially fossily still by the middle of the century. Now, they can be made non-fossily uh, with the injection of additional capital and there are a variety of ways to get to nearly zero carbon uh, uh, additions. And this pie chart on the right shows one calculation that's done using the IEA so-called sustainable development scenario in which they force everyone to be electrified by 2030 and limit uh, the probable temperature rise to a little over one and a half degrees. Uh, that's hard to do and it's expensive. Uh, so we have this, this challenge of increasing access, which we want to do, can't really prevent it from happening, even if we don't want it to happen, uh, and at the same time trying to get onto a green trajectory. Now, getting onto a green trajectory by adding green uh, new, new uh, connections isn't the same as industrializing. Uh, 
And clearly, these countries also have to substantially modify and expand their power systems over time and add capacity, uh, which will not be uh, nearly as easy to add in an all-green manner uh, as, as it is for these, these additional connections we're making, mostly in rural areas. So to talk about these complicated subjects, I have two complicated people uh, and, and eminent eminent graduates of, of MIT. Uh, on my right is Kate. Paul introduced Kate briefly, but I'll say a little bit more about her. She really has a spectacular career. She left MIT and went to the World Bank and ran the Lighting Africa program, then to Google, uh, then to Power Africa, where she was, uh, I always thought of, uh, in charge. Uh, I, I believe she was the director of energy for Power Africa, which is USAID's premier program to expand both access and uh, generation capacity in, in Africa. Uh, and now she's moved on to Nithio, which is focused on the, trying to address the problem of how you finance the uh, uh, increase of, of uh, connections in developing countries. Ignacio Perez Arriaga is uh, also an MIT alumni who went on to return to Spain to create his own institute, uh, in part modeled on his experiences here, uh, was incredibly successful and has become sort of the epicenter of electricity research. Uh, both in networks as well as in regulation uh, in Europe. Uh, and he's uh, graciously returned as a very long-term visiting professor to share what he's learned now with us. Uh, and, and we learn more from him every day. I have the great pleasure of working uh, very closely with Ignacio in, in many projects. Um, uh, I think probably the most important of which to me at any rate is in leading the Commission to End Energy Poverty. Let's turn to Kate. And Kate, tell us what Nithio is doing and, and how you're trying to deal with financing using technology. Sure. Thanks, Rob. And uh, I want to echo Dave Danielson's statement that it's, it's nice to be home. It's always nice to be back at MIT. Uh, and really enjoyed listening to all of the sessions on advanced storage and research happening in nuclear, because uh, really none of that is needed from our perspective to, to solve energy access. If we're just talking about really first basic access in developing world, it's a low energy requirement. It's a low ability to pay. There's a pretty good solution that works right now. And conveniently, it's a very low carbon solution. Solar panel combined with LED lighting. Uh, you can have a few energy efficient appliances. You can have a basic package that's really affordable and available to households that are remote from the grid and unlikely to be connected to the grid anytime soon. And as Rob mentioned, there's still hundreds of millions of people who, who fit that category. And so we don't need any of those advanced technologies to make this happen. What we do need is a way to uh, get them to people. So I, I liked the comment earlier about if you have solar very lightweight, maybe it's easier to distribute. Uh, the distribution is a little bit less of an issue than the money. Uh, this is working with populations that are remote, they're rural, and, and pretty low income in almost every case. And so they're looking for something that they can afford that's not going to be this massive purchase up front. And same as how we afford anything, you know, very few of us pay cash for a car, you usually finance it. Same thing for these solar home systems. There is a financing solution. So I'm getting to where the, the niche that we fit into on this. The, the problem with financing something is able to, being able to do a credit check. And so if you're going to a household that is you know, a remote part of Western Kenya with a household that has very few assets, is very low income, but they can afford to pay a little bit of uh, time to pay for the solar home system, how do you actually assess whether they're going to be able to pay for this? Are they going to be able to pay for two to three years for the system? And so what we at Nithio do is try to uh, work on this bottleneck specifically. How do you address the, the credit assessment for these households? And to do that, we draw on a, a partner company, which is a data platform called Frame, F-R-A-Y-M. Uh, and they, they've pulled together really the best information out there on, um, on households in Africa, pulled together all the survey sets, harmonize all the data, and then use that to kind of use machine learning to extrapolate what are the, the characteristics of different households um, at a kind of one by one kilometer uh, grid. And so you can say with pretty good accuracy, you go into an area, okay, well, households in this area are most likely to have you know, an improved roof or an improved floor or a certain level of education. And we use that data to be able to assess credit risk. So our goal is really to, to kind of unstick this bottleneck on the financing side. It would be great if there were advances in, uh, you know, in the batteries, in the, the PV, more of that is needed uh, on the large scale systems. For this, like I said, is really a package solution that's ready to go. But the financing and operations is really where the bottleneck is. So we're, we're, we're there with the technology, at least to the point where it could it's, always get better. Because it's, it, it's you know, the, the lower cost it gets, the, the more people you can reach with it without needing to have longer and longer terms for financing. But as it is right now, it can be deployed to hundreds of millions of people. 
So, Ignacio, is this the way everybody's going to be electrified? Is this, uh... <laughs> He'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob, you started with the um, slide presenting some results and some projections from uh, IEA. Uh, the, the director of the IEA, Fatih Birol, a couple of years ago, in the introduction to uh, the special report on electricity access or energy access, he said that uh, achieving universal access will not cost the Earth. And I'd like to examine that statement, because I think that it is based on some assumptions and some models that maybe uh, could be improved. And I'm going to uh, provide some uh, snippets, some uh, pieces for thought and discussion uh, related to that. So um, first of all, the, the model assumes that people will stay where they are. So it's a static model. But uh, in the latest uh, report, um, International Energy Agency report, um, World Energy Outlook, a few weeks ago, they said that about 500 million people will move from rural Africa to the cities. So that means that the pattern of consumption that they are having now will not be the same that they are going to have in the by 2040, when those 500 million people are estimated to move to other places. Um, the model could be significantly improved. We have been working together with Rob and other people here at MIT for the last seven years in a model that determines what is the least cost uh, planning for electrification, uh, looking with a granularity of individual households and granularity in time of the hour. So it is very powerful, and the results uh, differ from the ones that uh, have been obtained with other more uh, crude models. And um, the, the other thing that is important is that least cost planning doesn't mean that it will happen. So uh, for instance, let's take India. India, in the last uh, two and a half years, have been able to electrify 300 million people by grid extension. Why? Because that was the policy that was dictated by the government. It is not maybe the least cost solution, but it is the one that has been implemented. Um, so regulation and, and policy are very important. When you see in that plot that uh, a lot of the new electrification will happen with mini grids, well, that requires that there is a regulation that incentivizes mini grids. But if the mini grids require donors and you don't have enough donors to electrify the entire Nigeria with 200 million people growing to 700 million people by the end of the century, then uh, the solution that is least cost will not happen. Something else will happen. Or people will remain without electricity. Uh, something that is also important is the impact of demography. We have seen, uh, the, again, the projection from the UN a few months ago that the population of sub-Saharan Africa, which is now uh, 1 billion people, by 2050 will become 2 billion people, so twice the population of Europe. So the problem of migration in Europe will, uh, is nothing compared to what will, will happen. Um, so demography and the movement of people to the cities will influence a lot what will happen with, with access. And, but at the same time, if access is successful and access brings education and brings economic growth and economic development, that will have a powerful influence on demography. And maybe that, th those estimates will not take place because we know that in developed countries, industrialized countries, demography in most of them is stagnant. So uh, that, that, that loop of influence is very important to take into account. Um, but for that, we need that the access should be meaningful. And meaningful means that it's not constraining what people want to do. That provides community services, that provides the possibility of having productive uses of electricity. And uh, that requires that the last mile works. That requires that there is a good service. So India has access to every household. Every household has now a plug. But that doesn't mean that they have electricity every hour of the day, or at the right times, or with the right voltage. And therefore, 
efforts that take care of bringing local generation and local storage to the places that where they could reinforce uh, the electricity supply are really critical. And that, again, means that the regulation of the last mile is properly done. Uh, electric cooking is a very interesting possibility, not only because of the impact on uh, electricity, but the, the, it is clean cooking, the, all the health issues that are associated to dirty cooking, but also because it could compete with LPG, which is the dominant uh, new solution, and that will be very good for climate change. Once you have the, the wires uh, reaching to every house, the additional cost of uh, the kilowatt hours that are needed for electric cooking is very small. And that also spread out the cost of the investments into many more kilowatt hours and makes possible uh, that access will be less expensive for the people that consume little. So that brings us to the issue of what happens with the generation mix. If in the end most people will be connected to the grid and we try to solve the problem at a local level, then uh, first of all, we need, as, as Rob was saying before, uh, we need um, that that last mile is properly regulated, it is functioning well, and this is what we try to do with this global, um, uh, global commission to end energy poverty, uh, which tries to make the distribution segment viable. Uh, which is a Herculean task because all the distribution companies in sub-Saharan Africa in the 40-something countries are broke. They are insolvent. And uh, with subsidized tariffs, with people that steal the power, with people that don't pay the bill, with very poor reliability. So the, the uh, approach, an approach that could solve that problem could simultaneously bring reliable power useful power to the end consumers and will be a credit worthy off taker for generation. And that is needed for generation that could be clean generation to, uh, to come and to provide electricity to the end consumers. So something that we are also, look, also looking for is how to fix the power pools, how to fix transmission investment that would make possible that variable uh, generation sources, uh, typically hydro, wind, and solar, uh, could, that are distributed in Africa in very different places, uh, could cooperate with one another and provide a reliable service. And um, what I have said, hydro and solar and wind, but I should say also gas. Gas is a very reliable and, uh, and, and plentiful resource in Africa. And I will tell you an anecdote, and with that I will finish because I'm talking a lot. Um, the anecdote is I am part of a task force uh, for the alliance between African Union and European Union, and um, looking at the investments and the alliance between, in energy between the, the two continents. And uh, one member of uh, that group uh, sent me an email a few days ago saying, well, I've seen that in a meeting that happened in Nigeria, they said specifically that despite climate change concerns, fossil fuels are still viewed as an important driver of economic growth and development. And he was scandalized because they were talking about fossil fuels. Well, I immediately looked at Wikipedia and saw that 41% uh, of the exports of um, Nigeria in oil and gas go to the European Union and that the investments in the gas companies in Nigeria come from uh, Shell, Exxon, Chevron, Total, and Eni. So we have to be aware that this is a complex issue, that when we talk about sustainable development and energy, uh, sustainable energy model, uh, that has three components, the economic component, the environmental one, and the social one. And I've been trying to show in some ways in which we could make progress simultaneously in the three of them. But in some cases, the progress happens, the needed progress happens only in two dimensions. And maybe the other one is not making progress. We have to be aware of the complexity of the relationship between access and climate change.
think it's okay. So, you're gonna you're gonna uh, yeah. have something about gas. I, I think Ignacio has presented perfectly how complicated this is. You've got issues of insolvent utilities. You've got long transmission lines. You have you know, fossil fuels still playing a major part. You have questions about what the demand is going to be in certain areas and cooking and all of that. All of that does need to be fixed. You are not going to get strong economic growth in any of these countries without a really functioning power system. Is it okay to wait with almost a billion people in the dark while that gets sorted out? Because this is not a near-term problem, and I don't think you would suggest in any way there's a near-term solution to it. But there is a way to uh, provide power at a way that is low carbon much more expediently. And this is what we've seen when I was with Power Africa working from on the policy side. There was a big shift in how governments were approaching this where it used to be politically un untenable to say, OK, we're not going to bring the grid here. We're going to bring it there, because no one over here is going to vote for you if you say that the grid's not going to come there. And there was a real distaste for off-grid power as it's not real electricity. I'm going to bring people, um, you know, I'm going to get elected based on promising real electricity. And I think the realization has been that real electricity may take five to 10 years, best case, in some areas. But a solar home system and these very small, compact systems can be delivered in a matter of weeks or months. And I think it's become now uh, politically beneficial to talk about, yes, you won't get the real power of the grid, but you will have power very quickly. The government will have some support for it. Maybe it's a microgrid in some cases. But this is going to be something that I think you're going to see an acceleration of that being used in uh, actually government programs because of that fact. So that, that actually is a nice segue into a, a number of really insightful questions here, one of which is, if I can sort of interpret a little bit, if, if you've got a bunch of private operators running around the country installing solar home systems of variable quality on people's roofs, walking away, <laughs> taking the cash, or building microgrids, maybe qualified or unqualified to do so, how do you ensure that these things keep working five or 10 years later or even two years later? It's a great question. And, and I think two answers. I, I know a lot of the development partners are really looking into this especially because one of the largest uh, solar home system providers in Africa, and by largest, it's still only a couple hundred thousand <clears throat> systems, but went bankrupt or filed for bankrupt protection earlier this year. Uh, and so there was a lot of question about what happens with those systems. I don't think that's entirely sorted out in terms of who takes over. Uh, ideally, there'd be kind of a third party service provider that can step in in those cases, which will hopefully uh, be rare. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also, I think these aren't necessarily long-term uh, devices. And I, I know we shouldn't think of it as you know, throw away like your cell phone. But in some cases, it is. Like Ignacio said, this is not the, it's not an unlimited uh, supply of power. It's also not attached to a household, necessarily. It's something you can move with you. It's something maybe you could expand or upgrade. But it's more we should think of it as kind of an appliance rather than your grid power system, which can't be changed. Do you want to comment on business models and regulation? Yes, like well, I fully agree with you. I think that um, off-grid solutions are, in some cases, the only solution because mm -hmm. of the distance from the grid in, in accessible areas. And in many cases, it is a transitory measure. Uh, but um, in order to answer the question of Rob about permanence and universality, I think that the approach that we are proposing in this global uh, commission is uh, well, the right one. Um, and that approach, it, when I am talking about distribution, I am not talking about extending the grid only. I'm talking about anything that has to do with the last mile. And that includes standalone systems, the solar kits, and includes mini grids. And what we are proposing is a type of business model in which a company takes responsibility for the three modes of electrification. That doesn't mean that it is exclusivity. Uh, they could make arrangement with mm -hmm. developers of mini grids, etc. But it is a company that takes responsibility that everybody will get electricity. So they will be the default provider. And they will be also the last resort provider. So if one of the mini grids, for instance, developers fails, they, could, they will have to take over. And that will be part of a compact that that company will have to make with the uh, government, with the regulator, with the rural certification agency, with the distribution company there, with the developers of, um, of grid solutions. And this is what we are trying to do in our visits to Nigeria, Rwanda, Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I fully agree with, with We're beginning one of our visits to Rwanda in about 10 minutes. Yes. <laughs> so I, maybe we could just take one, yes. one more really Eight interesting minutes. question, uh, which relates to, to funding all of this activity in, in, in developing countries and, and the possibility of trading carbon credits. There used to be something called the Clean Development Mechanism that was envisaged under Kyoto, which was sort of naive. But, but trade in carbon credits uh, between countries is one of the key topics in the Madrid, Madrid discussions right now. I don't know how they're going to play out, but 
it, it does uh, beg the question, how, how does this wealth get transferred to these, these countries to build these systems? They still have to be subsidized. Any, uh, any takers on that? <laughs> <laughs> you were at the World Bank. That didn't work. Yeah, I was, I was trying to think of there, because ideally you would want to see governments pushing for this themselves. I mean, that's ideal. And, and the transfer of wealth is probably a, a good way to go. But if you talk to, say, in Nigeria, there's not a strong push for, oh, we need to decarbonize because of our <laughs> commitment. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's really about, this is where you get a, a kind of a tension between access and decarbonization, is if Nigeria thought that they could supply power to industry and to a household using oil or coal, they probably would do it. Uh, and not to say that's unique to Nigeria. I think that's uh, for most countries that don't have universal access. So I think coming in with a mentality of, oh, you have to decarbonize because it's the right thing to do, I think there has to be a way to match up. You have to decarbonize because it is the fastest, cheapest way to provide power and to power industry. And I think I would rather see that type of approach. Um, and maybe that's mm -hmm. you know, investment coming from, uh, from other countries that can do that. But it has to be something that's simple, and it has to be something that is going to meet the needs of the country, not just the needs of kind of the global reduction in carbon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a, it's a good idea. It's a good economic concept. Uh, in the case of Nigeria that you are mentioning, <laughs> it will be great because in Nigeria, there are seven times more installed capacity of backup diesel generators than centralized generation. Yeah. So any project, any program that would displace those diesel generators and replace them by solar, uh, will make, I mean, earn a lot of credit. So if that could happen, that is fine. I am a little bit more impatient than that because I think that, that a measure like this will take time. And I, I am more bidding for uh, large investors that will make these arrangement, arrangements with the governments and the regulators and all that, and will partner uh, with the incumbent distribution companies to fix the problem directly. Uh, but I think that it, that could work, and particularly in Nigeria, would be an excellent playground for that. I'm, I'm with you. I'm betting on technology, good business models, and smart regulation. And uh, I'm betting on you guys. So <laughs> yeah, please join me in thanking them. <laughs>